Hi everyone, I'm Matt Clark, research analyst for Money Markets. Uh, and as usual, each and every week, joining me is Green's Unfortunate co-editor, Charles Sizemore. It is time we talk investing with Charles. Uh, one of the many features we have on our YouTube channel, if you are not subscribed to YouTube, I encourage you to do so. Just click that subscribe button on our YouTube page and then mash that notification bell. You get notified each and every time we put up a new video. It could range anywhere from today's video, Investing with Charles, to our Marijuana Market Update, the Bull and the Bear podcast, as well as our Ask Adam Anything series. Now, Charles, I wanna jump right into it. Today, we're gonna talk about infrastructure. Not necessarily the sexiest of topics to get into, but it is one that is starting to materialize a little bit more. What I'm talking about here is uh, the infrastructure deal that is, is, is slowly slogging its way around the Potomac in Washington and could become reality at some point, uh, maybe in the next 30 days. We've got two, two bills Just here. Uh, that, fingers crossed. Well, we've exactly. been, I feel like we've been talking about this for a year now. So we have been. Fing, fing, fingers crossed. And I don't want to get into the politics of it. We could dive deep into that and, and, and spend an entire show on that. But I don't uh, want to do that. I think what we have here is we have two bills. We've got a one point five trillion dollar social spending bill. We have a one point seven five trillion dollar infrastructure bill. They were once one together. Now they're separate, but they are moving together. The House hopes to vote on both of these sometime uh, by the end of this week, if not early next week. That will move it over to the Senate, which it faces a whole myriad of issues that we won't even get into. Let's just go on the premise that at least the $1.75 uh, trillion dollar infrastructure deal is going to pass. My question to you, very, very simple. And that is, if you are an investor, and we are, uh, and anyone who's listening probably is as well, what is something you're looking at? What is a stock you're they're looking not, at? They're on the wrong podcast here, right? Exactly. Like they're, they're clearly doing something exactly. wrong. Exactly. If you've stumbled on this and trying to figure out what's a fashion about. blog. So uh, exactly, you're looking for exactly. shoes or purses or something, you, 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 you might have come to the wrong place. But He wears Patagonia. Yeah. I have Tommy Bahama. If you're not into that, I can't help you. Um, but no, you know, we, we, we see some shortfalls with a lot of infrastructure spending. Uh, you know, we're right now about uh, $2.5 trillion uh, in funding gaps between what we have funded already and what are the needs are by 2029. Got a graphic on that. We'll show that a little more in depth later. Um, but what is a way investors can play this fingers crossed potential passage of this massive spending bill to improve roads, waterways, bridges, dams, um, you know, fire, you know, internet infrastructure, all sorts of things. What is what? What are you looking at here as a way to play this and provide investors with profit? Yeah, sure. So pure plays are not wow. Just hack, cough, allergies. Anyway, uh, pure plays here are not. Um, they're, they're they are few and far between. So you have to to, to find companies that have uh, you know, a mixture of products that don't don't get in your way, so to speak. And I'll give an example. Caterpillar is an obvious infrastructure stock. It's, you know, they've been around forever. You can't really build a large highway project without, without Caterpillar equipment. The only problem with that is they're also very highly dependent on the mining sector. So by buying the Caterpillar stock, you're implicitly betting that the mining sector does really well. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's not your thesis. Maybe that's not what, what you really want to do, right? So a stock that I, I really like right now, I've been following it for months, and it's one that I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish on right now, is Oshkosh. So Oshkosh is not a, you know, quote, you know, pure play of, of, of infrastructure. Now, they do a lot of infrastructure equipment. They make cement mixers. They make cherry pickers. They make you know, all of these random, just random specialty trucks that very few other people make. But <clears throat> there are other businesses are not particularly cyclical. They make things like fire trucks, like mail trucks, like random military trucks and equipment. All of that stuff tends to be fairly stable. And demand just doesn't change that much from year to year. But then there's also this other sort of catalyst here. You know, what, why Oshkosh? Why are they special? You know, why them instead of the you know the heavy duty equipment maker down the street? Part of it is they've really gone big on electrifying their their products. They, and that's a big priority of the current administration. They, they're, they're really big on green energy, battery powered vehicles, et cetera. Now, not all of Oshkosh's vehicles are, are battery powered, not even close, but that is a, a, a big kind of high profile thing they're doing. Like they are, they are making a lot of noise about having electric uh, versions of, of their heavy duty trucks. And so that's, that puts them in in, in favor of uh, of the government right now. And as an example, they uh, they recently won the the contract to to replace the uh, the, the postal service uh, mail truck fleet. 
And while not all of the mail trucks are electric, that's that's not how it, it panned out. A decent percentage of them are. And so that's that's one of those very kind of nice, uh, high profile uh, items that, that that really kind of makes this uh, kind of gets this stock on the radar of, of people that may not have normally been on the radar of. Now, looking at, uh, you know, actual and estimated total annual revenues for Oshkosh, uh, 2020 was a down year. They they went from $8.3 billion in revenue uh, in 2019 to $6.8 billion in total revenue in 2020. This can be easily explained away. You had the COVID-19 pandemic. Work just really wasn't being done. Businesses were very skittish on buying new products, spending new capital, spending capital. The world froze. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think that you can explain that. Uh, explain that kind of drop in revenue away very easily. Looking at projections into 2023, uh, obviously we're going to see nice tick ups of total revenue for Oshkosh uh, in 21, 22, and 23. By 2023, 8.8 billion dollars is expected in total revenue. That would be a, a that would beat the high pre COVID that this company had. So you can see a nice earning trajectory in terms of how much money this company is projected to bring in. Stock wise, uh, you know we had a nice run up along with other infrastructure stocks uh, into May. Those have paired back. Uh, talks. So now the excitement kind of wears off on these infrastructure plays. Uh, Oshkosh was right along there with them. Uh, they dropped to a low of about 90, I want to say 98, $97 per share, but they appear to have bounced back a, a bit and now trading above the hundred dollar mark. They're actually closer to 110 uh, at this point. So they are moving forward. They are about two or $3 above their 50 day simple moving average, which is a nice uh, bullish signal that the stock still has some more room to run. Um, but what I want to focus on here for you, Charles, is looking at our proprietary green zone rating system, which anyone can access at moneymarkets.com. Just go to moneymarkets.com, look at the little top bar, type in any stock you want to look for, and you can see it's ranking. We rank on six different uh, six different metrics, uh, three price-based, momentum, uh, size, and volatility, and then we have fundamental-based, three of those, uh, value, quality, and growth. Now, overall, uh, as of right now, Oshkosh ranks, uh, rates a 57, which is a neutral rating, very close to being bullish, but still neutral. Uh, tell us why you are using kind of that, that proprietary Charles Sizemore thought here to, to really push this and think that you know, 57 may be neutral, but it's still worth uh, an investor look. Yeah, well, you know, the devil's always in the details and 57 is awfully close to that 60 threshold for bullish. Uh, normally, we'd like to see it over 60 and, and this stock has has kind of flirted with that level, you know, off and on for the last several months. But it's it's that being below 60 by itself is not necessarily disqualifier so long as what's going on under the hood here is positive. And it, for the most part, it is. Looking at some of the, uh, you know, the submetrics here, look at some of the individual factors. It rates particularly well on quality. It rates at 96, meaning that it rates, you know, only 4% of the stocks in our entire universe here rate higher based on quality. Now, quality is a factor of several things. There's several submetrics, submetrics that go into that, but it's primarily profitability and balance sheet management, you know, balance sheet quality there. Um, this is a profitable company. Their margins are good. And importantly, their debt is very, very low. This is a very uh, conservatively managed company. That's why it gets a very high quality score. That's good. We'd like to see that, particularly since, you know, personally, I look at the, the broader market. I'm not super comfortable with valuations right now. I'm not super comfortable with uh, you know, market outlook over the next year or two. I do prefer to, to stick with higher quality names and ideally cheaper names, which brings me to the next factor. Uh, Oshkosh also rates particularly well based on value. It rates in 88, <clears throat> puts it cheaper than all but 12% of the stocks in our universe. Now, this is a gritty you know, industrial stock. It's, it's, it's you know, probably never going to trade at the kind of premium that a glitzy tech stock would trade, and that's fine. It's still, it, it's, a, it's an undervalued stock. It's, an, it, it's a high quality undervalued stock in a market that where in a market where it's really hard to find bargains these days, honestly. But, uh, you know, moving on, uh, volatility, it, it's it's not a particularly volatile stock. It rates a 46 there, which is very much middle of the pack. So, you know, it, it's not, this is not a stock that's going to give you heartburn. It should move. It should have volatility roughly on par with that of the broader market. Um, growth, this is where I think our, uh, our, our, our system it does have certain shortcomings and that our growth metric here is backward looking, right? So we're looking at, you know, how this stock has grown over varying timeframes, but all 
backwards. Well, if you do believe, as we do, of course, that infrastructure spending is about to really pick up, that that's, that's going to accelerate, then this growth metric is understated. I think this, this company should grow going forward at a, at a higher rate than what, it's, uh, than, than what its current score suggests. Momentum, um, it doesn't rate well now. It rates at 33. But as we discussed earlier, Part of that is because this stock really got ahead of itself. All the infrastructure stocks really jumped ahead earlier this year. They were doing fantastically well because there was all of this uh, enthusiasm for the bill. Well, as the, the talks, you know, drone on for months now, and it's just, it seems like this is just never going to end. There's almost despondency and despair about this, the prospects of the bill ever finally getting signed. That, that took a toll on, on that momentum. The you know, momentum really flagged over the last couple of months. But as we discussed earlier, the stock really bounced hard off of its October lows. It has been doing well ever since. So um, I do think momentum, even though it, it is low today, I think that it is highly likely that momentum really picks up in the weeks ahead here. And in size, yeah, it's a big company. It rates at 25 on our size metric. Not, not a lot we can do about that. There's a $7.3 billion dollar market cap will do that. Yeah. Well, what, what are you going to do? It's a big company. It is. And if that, that's not going to change. So um, no. over, o- overall, Oshkosh, good company here. It, it, it does rate a neutral, but as Charles has kind of explained, you know, you have to, you know, you have to take the green zone rating system uh, and, and apply some of your own, uh, you know, your own subjective thought here. And that's what Charles has done for you is that he has said, okay, yes, it rates here, but and so you have to kind of you know factor all that the in. The system is fantastic at analyzing the historical trends leading up to the present, right? Correct. But what it's not going to tell you is what is that catalyst, right? That's where you have to use your own intuition here. Exactly. And the catalyst here is is very obvious. We have what is potentially a generational move by the government to to uh, really improve our infrastructure. That is a major catalyst that doesn't come along that often. Exactly. It comes around once every 20, 30 years, maybe at best. So uh, uh, the we last are, one that I remember, I, it's, I think it's further back than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not likely that we'll see one like this anytime soon. So just to kind of put it all in perspective in, in doing some work between 2020, 2029, uh, the U.S. has funded about three point three five billion dollars uh, or a trillion dollars rather in infrastructure. It needs almost six trillion so we're about two and a half uh, trillion dollars short of funding. Transportation is the largest. It's got about a one point two trillion dollar funding gap between what we funded so far and what we need by 2029. Uh, you know, you've got drinking water, wastewater, electricity, airports, waterways, uh, dams, hazardous waste, levees, uh, parks and rec, schools. All these, all these factors in terms of infrastructure, and that's not even taking into account internet, which is a, another big thing, rural internet, rural broadband, 5G, all these things are grossly underfunded. A $1.75 trillion spending bill is not going to fix all of it, but it is certainly going to put us in the right direction. And as, as Charles has, has alluded to, Oshkosh is certainly a way, as an investor, that you can uh, play on this trend and get in now uh, before anything happens, and this and this stock is 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 it starts to break heavy, and you start to start reaping some of the rewards uh, of of what Congress is looking to do now. So, Charles, anything else you want to add? <clears throat> no, well, you know, this infrastructure trend is is long term in nature. You know, there's going to be some you know in, investors will their enthusiasm for it will wax and wane, but if you are looking for a trend that you really can buy and hold and sort of ride out the noise. I think this is one. I think this is this is a trend that you can potentially invest in here for the next five, seven years. No problem. And now we're just waiting on Congress to act. So good luck with that. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully by the end of November, we will see uh, we will see some action put in place and we will be off to the races for the next uh, decade or two on spending one point seven five trillion. And companies like Oshkosh will start reaping those benefits and thusly investors like you and I will start reaping those rewards. For Charles Sizemore, uh, I am uh, Matt Clark, research analyst for Money and Markets. Uh, it has been a great investing with Charles. Charles, thanks for joining. Uh, look forward to doing it again next week. Or actually, I think we're off next week. Uh, it'll be the week after we'll be doing it. We'll be doing investing with Charles, but look forward to doing Anticipation. it again. Anticipation. 
just exactly just let, let, let the anticipation for, build. But we're laying that foundation for you to, to whet the appetite and want more. So uh, there we have it. Uh, until next time, again, I'm Matt Clark, research analyst uh, for Money and Markets uh, for Charles Sizemore, Green Zone Fortunes co-editor. Uh, by the way, uh, Adam, Charles and I coming out with uh, our, our next pick for uh, Green Zone Fortunes. Do encourage you to check that out. Maybe if we can, we can put a, a little uh, thing up top here on YouTube, let you know how you can find out more about Green Zone Fortunes and getting into this uh, monthly, great monthly uh, service that uh, Adam, Charles and I uh, provide. It's great. It's got a wonderful track record, doing very well. Uh, look forward to that. So until next time, everyone, uh, safe trading.